Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Go to look at verse 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. We're in a series for those who might be visiting us both by internet and those who are visiting us with here tonight. Uh, we're studying a dying grace. Uh, this is our... I guess maybe our second lesson. Is this our second lesson? So we've just started. So I'm in the fifth chapter. If I can find it. Fifth chapter, verse six, five, six, no, six, seven, and eight. And uh, I want you to pay attention to the word body. Body. Okay? Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. Notice that's the second time they've said that. What's the subject? What do you think subject is? Body. <laughs> What, what about the body? What, whether we're present in it or absent from it. Right? Either we're present in it or we're absent. Now, I guess we're all present in it tonight. Right? So what would have to happen for us to be absent from our body? Death. Death. There you go. And so what's he telling us to be of good courage? Because he's, now he's mentioned it twice. He mentioned it in verse 6 and now in verse 8. Agreed? Be of good courage. Be of good courage. Verse 6. Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, alive, we are absent from the body. Therefore, uh, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body, death, and be at home with the Lord. Right? And so the body is a very big deal here, isn't it? He's talked about it twice on the word, be of good courage. Right? And actually, the subject is about whether you're in the body or out of the body, whether you're living or dead. Right? Right? Well, I don't guess we have to worry about the good courage if we're dead. So it must be oriented to those of us who are alive. And it's about us who are oriented while still alive about death. We should be of good courage. Now, he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to those people who believe that Jesus died for their sins was buried on the third day, raised from the dead. They call that the gospel. If you believe that, you're saved. If you don't believe it, you're not saved. If you are saved, then absent from the body at death is to be present with the Lord who is at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Right? So you get to go to heaven. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's in heaven. He's saved at the right hand of God the Father in third heaven. Last week, we talked about the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. Now I'm in 2 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> okay? Now, I want to open with prayer about somebody who has just had this experience. I got a call from Eddie Lacey. Remember, we've been praying his stepmother um, uh, had a severe stroke, and they thought that it would be crucial within 72 hours whether she lived or died, and she died. So, <clears throat> this was a great conversation with I and Eddie when we heard she had a stroke and was taken to the hospital about where is she in the perspective of in the body and out of the body. And so, he was confident that she was a believer. He had, con had conversations with her before. And uh, so he could be of great courage. I mean, it's a win-win for the mother-in-law. If she, if she lives, then this is a good thing. And if she dies, it's a better. 
not better necessarily for the family, but it's better for her <laughs> because to be absent from the body is to be at home. Did you notice that? At home with the Lord. At home with him. At home. Now, that's a, a wonderful idea, isn't it? I'm not just going to be in his presence. I'm not going to be a stranger. I'm going to be at home. <clears throat> right? There's a difference. You know, I'm not visiting a strange place. I'm at home. And so that's a wonderful thing. So we're going to talk about that. And, and then, of course, we're going to have prayer for Eddie and his family as they go through the bereavement process and the burial Wednesday tomorrow. And, uh, uh, and they're, they're of good courage. We call that a promotion, that his stepmother was promoted from time to eternity. And that's a wonderful thing. Listen, without that faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you don't have this. There's no way you can be... There's no way you've got good courage unless you're just glad that somebody died to get them out of your hair. Uh, I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not a good thing, but so I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about a good way to have courage about this. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. Before we have our prayer, though, let me remind you of classroom etiquette. If you are a believer in the gospel of Christ, by that, I mean you believe he died for your sins, buried and raised from the dead third day. That's called the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. And it tells you in Romans 1, 16 that the gospel is the power of God to save you. you. Can't save yourself. Nobody else can save you except the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel is that he died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day. If you believe that, the moment you believe... It says the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the power of God to save you. When you believe it, then the power of God saves you. Not, and, and that's why it's a gift of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. What a wonderful gift because it's a gift that keeps on giving. You know that old saying? The gift that keeps on giving. Well, certainly that is the gift that keeps on giving. And not only in time but in eternity. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. And Eddie, of course, understands this. And according to Eddie, his stepmother understood that. And so we can be of good courage in our prayer for them. Uh, how would I know? This It's a spiritual book. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study the Bible in carnality. How would I know if I'm carnal? It'd be evidence of... In your mind, there would be evidence in your conscience about personal sin. Now, that sin could be mental attitude sin. It could be sin of the tongue or it could be overt sin. But you would be aware of it. Your conscience and the ministry of the Holy Spirit would, would bring you to an awareness of that. Then what do I do with it? See, that's always the problem. What do I do with the sin as a Christian? What do I do with that? Well, the work of Christ on the cross is extended to your Christian life. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, whatever that sin might be, if you will confess it, meaning you have that privilege because in the church age, every believer is a believer priest. You're a priest in 1 Peter 2. And so you have the privilege to confess your sin in privacy at any time of the day, at any place through your priesthood. You can confess that sin to the Father, and he will restore you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit inside you. And the Holy Spirit's a great teacher of the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. So let's have a word of prayer. I'll give you a moment uh, for you to examine. This is true for those who are visiting with us by the Internet class. We expect the same classroom etiquette from you. Uh, take, take a moment. Evaluate personal sin. If you're aware of it, confess it in silence, in privacy, if we confess our sins, the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That'll beat any deal you'll find on Black Friday. Right there. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come and visited with us in our Bible study, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit that people would take the seriousness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person. 
to teach him the truth because the truth sets us free from the cosmic system of thinking that stands in contrast to the will of God. We have a desire and a heart as a believer to, to please you by being obedient to your will. Not our will, but thy will be done is the motto of the Christian life as well as the life of Christ. And so I pray, Father, that the exercise of, of responsibility of our priesthood has, has transpired and we are now ready to study the truth of the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you'll notice on your paper, if you have a, a study guide with you, that uh, we're looking at the second Corinthians of five, six, seven, and eight. And of course, it's the idea of the body. It's mentioned a great deal. So we always look for clues, whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body. Remember, we read that last week in second Corinthians 12. Paul on the first missionary trip had been stoned to death. And he wasn't sure if he was unconscious or if he actually died. He wasn't quite sure about that. And so this is how he describes the experience, whether in the body or out of the body, whether I was unconscious or whether I actually died and went to the third heaven. I do not know. But here's the secret. God knows. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's a simple principle about who God is. But, he, but God knows. God knows everything, but he, but he knows everything about us. That's what's wonderful, uh, I suppose. God knows, and then he... So, in the body and out of the body has been a theme of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. I mean, Paul is going to be already all over this idea in the first 1 Corinthians, like chapter 15, and then all over it in, in the second book, he writes about it in the 5th chapter and the 12th chapter. Right? So he's all over this subject. Uh, and most of us who go to funerals come back and we go like, well, why? You know, I, I've been engaged in quite a bit of it. And you, you always walk out of the funeral. I, I was thinking about doing this series until I went to Rome, Georgia and, and did a funeral on my way home. I went, I got to talk more about this. Um, even though I think you're, you're well prepared for it. It's still, it's a reminder to me that this subject is pretty big and we need to spend some time on it. And so Paul talks about in the body or out of the body. And then when he comes back to chapter five, he gets it in a pretty interesting way. So I, I wrote this down in your paper. Now I'm at, still at the top up there with 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Paul said a similar thing that he said in chapter 12, he said in chapter 5. And he says, therefore, being always of good courage. And, and that's like, for me, the word good courage, it's in six and it's in eight. Now, this is really important. For me, that's like two pieces of good bread, right? Be of good courage. And then what's in the, sa what's in the sandwich is what makes how you call the sandwich, right? You don't call it a piece of bread unless <laughs> that's all you got. But if you got two pieces of bread, whatever you put in it is called a ham sandwich, an egg sandwich, you can tell I'm hungry. All my illustrations tonight will be on food. <laughs> but anyhow, be of good courage. And then the word knowing. See the word knowing? Now, this is oida. Uh, that comes off from horeo, but in the perfect tense. Therefore, this is something that we know. We know this. Um, in the perfect tense, it means that we have cycled it. We have uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. It means it's inhaled to be exhaled, right? Just like breathing. You know, you breathe inhale to, in order to exhale. You exhale in order to inhale, right? So it's the exercise. So the person who inhales and never exhales, then we do a funeral on them, <laughs> right? So, I mean, either way that goes, it's not healthy. So... All scripture, that's 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. And then he goes into a subject about how profitable the word of God is when you as a believer hear it and don't let it go in one ear and out the other, but you keep it in there, you think on it, and then you inhale it, you bring it into a place of, of believing it in faith, and then through faith you exhale it. You apply it to your life. That word oida is really important because when you're ready to uh, not just to go to class and hear the Bible, but when you're ready after class to apply that 
by faith in your life, you've got oida. Oida is what drives the word of God out of, out of, out of your life and into application. Oida. I know. I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's a pretty powerful idea if you know it. All right? Not just that I've heard somebody say that, but I know. But how do you know your Redeemer lives? Because he was raised from the dead. How do you know it? Because the Bible says it. So, therefore, always being of good courage, knowing this is very important, because here's what we're knowing. Okay? And, and oida means we've cycled it. Here's what we know. Always be of good courage, knowing. You can always be of good courage if you got the right information cycled in your soul so you can bring it out in application. When somebody dies, boom, you got it. You're ready. So he says, being always of good courage, knowing that while, and here's what knowing is, while at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Right? Right? Okay. Then it says, and, and here's the sandwich, here's what's between the two, here's what's between now, knowing the be right? Absence and presence, knowing that, for we walk by faith, not by sight. See, that's the results of knowing. See, oida means I've heard it, I've understand it, I believe it, I'm now ready to walk it out in my life. I'm ready to walk it out, right? We walk by what? Faith, not by <coughs> sight. <coughs> See, and this is what makes us, this is what makes us, that's all part of that knowing. Then he comes back, we are of good courage. See that? We are of good courage. Say, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That's, listen, these are death experiences that we can be encouraged about. Death should not be a bad thing in your life or with the people in your life. Do you understand that? The people in your life that you're fearful that if they died, you don't know whether they'd go to heaven or hell. They're going to go one place or the other. There's no doubt about that in the scriptures. I mean, even Jesus didn't get away from that. So, the thing is, if that's true, then be of good courage to walk the gospel into their life and share it with them, right? You share that gospel with them. If that bothers you, listen, holidays, you look around your family, you go like, got about five people here that really need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're from 12 years old up to 80. You know what you do? You mingle around that group this year. Instead of talking gobbledygook, you talk about Christ. Because, listen, when you pick up the newspaper and you read the obituary, they're all ages in there, aren't they? Don't think it's just old people who die. I mean, that young basketball player out of Montgomery or out of Montevallo, my goodness. You do know that when you die, you're always in the prim prime of your life. When you die. Especially if you're a believer. Because you, you die on his timetable. You don't die on yours, nor your doctor's or somebody else's. Ecclesi you know, Ecclesiastes third chapter. It's a time to die, a time to be born, a time to die. Listen. Be of good courage. I prefer ready to be absent from the body and to be at home. Now, at home. Say, at home. That's a wonderful idea, isn't it? Jesus, in the upper room discourse, uh, uh, John 13 through 17, in the, at the Last Supper, in the upper room discourse, in the 14th chapter, he says something that is probably preached at more funerals than anything in the whole wide world. The first three verses of John 14. And he talks about, I go, I go let not your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. Because they were all going, where are you going that we can't come? Where are you going and we can't come? Where are you going and we can't come? You can come, but it'll be later. Stop being troubled. 
See? And then he goes in, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You're not going to go to a place that's not been prepared. Listen, when you get there, it'll have your name on the room door. The pl what? <laughs> We've been looking for you. You're on our, you're on our register. What, what's your register called? The Book of Life. There it is, room 12. Just go find your name. I love that. We understand, Paul says, at home in the body means alive and absent from the body as at home with the Lord means death. Whether you're in your body with the Lord or out of your body with the Lord, you're at home. Are, uh, but the question is, are you at home? Are you comfortable with the Lord in your life? Are you comfortable? I mean, that's what home is, isn't it? Home is the house. Right? You can have a you can have a house and it can be a war zone. <laughs> you go, this is not a house, this is this is a war zone. I tell you though, when you a house becomes a home, that's a that's a place you always want to be. Right? I mean, I don't know how many times I think not nah, my grandparents are gone now. But I went home every year. I'd go home. You know why? I went, listen to me now, I went home. I owned property here, and I was married, and I had kids. I packed them all up, and we went home. Not because I lived there, but because, not necessarily, but that's where I was from, because it was home. It was home. I mean, I walked in that house. I could smell my grandma. I could smell her cooking. I mean, it was home. In those days, people stayed at the home, you know. We still have that house and everything up there. The home is different than a house and a home, man. But listen, are you at home with Jesus here? Are you at home here? Are you at home with him in your body so that when you are out of your body, you're, st you're looking forward to going home to be with the Lord? I was sitting holding Aunt Bice's hand as a young preacher. I was holding her hand. And she was, they, you know, they said, listen, Pastor, she's liable to go just any time. And she was a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, if I could have had four professors as smart as she was, I'd have been a smart guy. And I was holding her hand, and she always wanted me to read the Bible to her. I was sitting there reading the Bible, and she began talking. So I stopped reading. God, if she talked, I listened. E.F. E Hutton moment. I listened. I mean, that woman, that woman, you did not want to miss whatever she had to say, even on her deathbed. And she began to talk to the Lord. And it wasn't like a prayer, you know, like now I lay me down to sleep kind of thing. I mean, it was a conversation with the Lord. So I just sat there and I went like, whoa, because everybody knew Aunt Bice. I mean, she was, <laughs> she was up there walking with the Lord. And she said, well, I've got to go now. And she was gone. Just like that. Just as peaceful. I'm gone. Well, I got I got to go now. Kind of thing. And I went, hmm? <laughs> gone. What a wonderful experience that was for me. What a wonderful experience that was for me. Oh, my goodness. That was a wonderful experience. <laughs> Let me tell you, I, I guarantee you, she was looking for, to go home to be with the Lord. I will tell you that. She was excited about it. She was excited about it. So at home, in the body means alive. Absent from the body means death. Both of them mean with the Lord. Home with the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. I want to talk about four things tonight about death that people don't really seem to understand or know. For, what is the origin? What is the origin of the human body? 
the body was the big subject here. We live in the body and we are absent. Are you at home with the Lord in the body or at home with the Lord out of the body? People don't, you know, they don't, they don't have a clue where the body comes from. They don't. So, listen, in Genesis, in Genesis 2, 21, 22, something really important. It says that God formed Adam's body out of the ground, dust of the earth. Okay? Formed his body. And out of it, and then he breathed the breath of life into him through his nostrils. He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. Right? And that's, that's how we understand breathing, right? I mean, if you think somebody's dead, you put something, you know, they used to, in the old day, they would take a, a mirror and put it, put it by, by their nose. We, we're more high-tech than that today, but it, it got the same results. But, but it's important you understand that. Now, out of Adam, now listen to me now. Out of Adam, that was only for Adam. Out of Adam, God put Adam to sleep. Probably wasn't hard, to, was it, ladies? You understand? <laughs> put him in his easy chair, give him, give him tea, and, and you got him right there. Well, anyhow, he puts him to sleep. However, he put him to sleep. Pro probably a sermon. That's how I put you to sleep. It's probably a sermon. Yes. Gave a sermon, put him to sleep, took a rib. A woman comes from a male's rib. Agreed? Not, not, a, not a pig rib or anything. <laughs> it comes from the male's rib. The woman comes from the male's rib. This is the only time we have this done. Now, people might rib you, but you didn't come from there. Right? They, 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 all that could happen, but that's... Uh, now, when that's done, all right, we're never going to have that done that way again. That, that's the first time. Because in Genesis 1, in verse 27, 28, he says, he says that, they're going to procreate. They're going to, they're going to multiply. They're going to cohabit and multiply. Okay? So here's what we know about where the body comes from. Originally, it came from the dirt. And with anybody who dies any time in human race, when they die, their body goes back to dust from where it came. It never leaves the earth. The, your body is never going to leave the earth. It's earthbound. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about different bodies. The bodies of birds, the bodies of fish, the body of stars, the body of the moon. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's quite a subject there about bodies. So, so, there, so we have Adam's body's made this way. Eve, the woman's body's made this way. And after that, and, and when, when, when that body's made, then God breathes the breath of life into her, and she becomes a living being. God breathes it into Adam, he becomes a living being. Are you with me? Now, when it comes to you and I, we come through procreation. Even Jesus Christ came into the world through the womb, but not through procreation. Right? Virgin birth. Right? Came through the Holy Spirit and Eve uh, and Mary. Okay, but he still came through the womb. All right, okay, but not but not through a male. Came through God. Okay, now, so the way our body comes is through procreation, and the writer says one of the real miracles of life, one of the real miracles of life before birth. Now, one of the great miracles, the psalmist says, comes from the fact. How is it that God can develop the bones and the tissues and the whole human system of the heart, the lungs, all inside the woman, right? And he says one of the great marvels, marvels of creation, one of the great marvels of creation is how a baby's formed 
inside a womb. And what, what that is, is, of course, the whole body idea. And then what, when they come out, when that baby's born, it's Nisha Mahaim, the breath of life, the breath of life. They're going to exist because God breathes into him life. And uh, he will have it until he dies when God retakes his, the Nisha Mahayim, the breath of life. Okay? So the body, because this is the subject we're talking about in death, right? In the body, out of the body. The body is important that we understand where the body comes from. Okay? So I've given you that under point one. It's also interesting when uh, in the third chapter after the, they fall, the Adam and Eve fall, um, the, when procreation, the subject comes back, you know, in verse uh, 16, the woman's curse, that she'll have travail, right, in childbirth. In that, in verse 20 of the third chapter, it says, we're going to call her name Eve because she's the mother of all living the mother of all living. That's what Eve means. Which, all of that's just kind of interesting. I mean, might be a gate question. Who would I, what do I know? Could be. That's important. But there's, here, here is procreation. I want you to remember this. And I put it on your paper, but there's a yada formula. In procreation, what he says multiply and increase, there's a yada formula. Yada, if uh, you remember... Um, Seinfeld, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Oh, that's where it comes from. I mean, not, it comes from the Bible. I mean, he stole it. <laughs> that actually comes from it. He stole that deal. But yada, yada, it means to know. And in Genesis 4.1, procreation starts, and it starts with a yada formula. Procreation. It's in Genesis 4. When it's on your paper, it's called the yada formula. Uh, I call it the yada formula. The yada formula, the yada formula I love the old King James when they call the birthing begat. Don't you love that? The begat. Do you remember? Uh, so and so, like in Genesis 5, um, Adam begat Seth and Seth begat, you know, the begats, the, bor the born uh, heritage. Um, but see, that's part of the Yada formula. The Yada formula. Right? And that's what we're born under is the Yada formula. Uh, Adam knew his wife. It doesn't mean they were, hi, honey. Uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the Yada formula. Well, anyhow, uh, so here's, here's what's interesting. Here's the kind of the bottom line of point one. While we have different, different sources of creation of a body, are you with me? We have dust from the ground, we have the rib out of the male making a female, and we have the yada formula of procreation, which we live under, right? I'm going to tell you what's the standard. Here's the one thing that's true for all of these, is, is uh, Nisha Mahaim, the breath of life. God breathes the breath, breathe the breath of life into all three forms. You understand? The common denominator... Here is three different body sources, right? The earth, the rib, and procreation. There's one standard, Nisha Mahaim. That is, the, that is the Hebrew words for breath of life. Actually, the Hebrew word Hayim ends in I am, and in Hebrew, if a word ends in I am, it's plural. Therefore, actually, it says the breath of lives. Okay. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, without sin and death, it was created, the human body, without sin and death, the human body in its original state was created to live forever without aging or dying. That's what you got to look forward to. And the reason you have aging and dying is because of Adam's sin and death. Because of sin and death. There's nothing you can do about it. Except be of good courage. <laughs> be of good courage. Because the body you have is temporary stay. 
the one, the one where you're going is permanent. This is temporary. This housing is temporary. It's temporary housing. Come on. <clears throat> so that's, that, that's kind of a perfect. But something happened to change it to sin and death. Something happened so that the human race is born under imperfect genetics. And what was that? What's well, Adam's sin? Adam's sin. Genesis 2.17, God says to them, don't eat of the tree. It gave them one commandment. Show you how, how hard it is. It don't matter if you have 26 or one. I mean, the devil will get you on whatever one he can get you on. All right? So he's, he gives them one commandment. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, dying you will die. So what they do? They ate. <laughs> That's tough parenting, isn't it? Uh, I forgot. And he had perfect, he had perfect ones. These, these people were not under sin and death like you and I, not to give us an excuse, but because it's all volitional. They had it all. They were in a perfect environment, perfect everything. They had a perfect, 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 perfect. They threw it away for, they threw it away to violate a command. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Well, maybe not. Here's the second thing. God is the originator of human life. Not only is he the originator of the human body, which is the big deal for, for, for this whole deal of dying, but listen, for human life. In, in Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then the Lord fashioned man of the dust from the ground. The word formed is yasa, and it, mean, it means to form. The Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's nishamahayim. It should be plural. I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. And the man became a haya nefesh. The Hebrew word for a living, a living soul became a, a living being. Haya nefesh. The word nefesh is soul. In the Hebrew, they don't make a distinction between the body, soul, and spirit like they do in the Greeks. They just talk about it as one unit. But there it is. Uh, Job, I don't know if this is on your paper somewhere probably, but Job 27.3 says, as long as life is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils, I mean, that's why when somebody, we, we don't know if they've died or not, we put, we put something under their nose to see. Listen, this, this thing started in the Garden of Eden, this breath of life breathed into you. It still exists today. If you want to know if God's real, breathe through your nose a couple times. If you can breathe through your nose, you know how that occurred? Because God did it. He set that program up. Every once in a while, I'll have an atheist come by. Somebody will send him. I think sometimes they plan them, but anyhow. And they wanted, I don't believe in God and all that. I said, breathe. Do this. And they'll go, I said, just do it. It'll be all right. They do that. I said, that's how you know there's a God. If there wasn't a God, you couldn't do that. You could breathe like a snake or something, but you couldn't breathe like that. Your nostrils. He says he breathed the breath of life into your nostrils. <laughs> In a lot of ways. Anyhow. So, notice that the breath of life is plural because it ends in I am, therefore we're talking about lives. This is important and often missed because of the English singular of the breath of life. But you should read Job 12.10 sometime in your life. Also 33.4, 34.14.15, and Psalms 104.29. Because they tell you something interesting. For example, Psalms 104.29 says, you take, away your, you take away your breath, 
and they expire. He says, when you, when he's speaking to God, he says, God, when you take away their breath, they die. That's how you die. How you're made alive, he puts Nishima Haim in you. When time comes to death, he calls it back, takes it back. The psalmist said it. All these, Job is just filled with it, and so is Psalms. He says, you take away your breath, they expire and return to the dust. That is your body. Because the whole breathing is for your body, isn't it? Well, if you have nostrils. The breath of life, or lives, bring life to the body, soul, and spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. They were created, created originally to live forever. The physical and the spiritual lives were one. The, the physical and the spiritual life were one. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47, if you're interested, and you should be. But, once again, something happened to change it to sin and death. What was that something? What was that something that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 that says, you're either dead in Adam or as a human race, you're either dead in Adam or you're alive in Christ. You're either dead in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, you're either dead in Adam or you're alive in Christ. No other place. You're born into Adam. The only way out of him is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians uh, 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 Colossians 1.13, that when Christ dies on a cross, burial, resurrection, the gospel, it reaches over here and rescues you from Adam and transfers you into Christ. That's a powerful idea. This wonderful exchange that comes by grace and not by works. It comes by you believing that Christ was sufficient to deliver you from the domain of, of, of Adam, which are 13 judicial charges that will send you to hell and transfer you over to the kingdom of God where you can never go there. The only place you can go is to heaven because you are in Christ. You're either in Adam, called the first Adam, or you're in Jesus Christ, called the last Adam because one lost it, the other one restores it. This is not complicated, but let me tell you, you're either there or there. There's no other place. You're either in Adam and lost, or you're in Christ, having been discovered by the grace of God. You are now part of the family of God. There's no in between this, dear hearts. There's none. In Isaiah 2.22, in the NIV, it says, stop trusting in man. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath himself in his nostrils. And what, of account, and what account is he? Of, of what value is he to you? You got the same thing. Why are you trusting in him? You need to trust in the one who gave you both the same opportunities in life, gave you life, breathe the breath of God in you. Breathe. Where does life come from? It comes from God. How do I know? Because he breathed life. He breathes life. It's called the breath of life, and it comes from God. When I say to this guy, well, do this. <laughs> what do you think you got that? You know what that is? No, that's called inhale, exhale. Th that's called breath. Oh, yeah. And where I come from in the north, in the wintertime, you could <laughs> blow it out, and you could see it. We used to do it all the time. We played like we were smoking when I was a little boy. We go. <laughs> Stop trusting in man. He's got, he's got nothing over you. He's got the same breath. He's got the breath of God in him. The same thing goes through his nostrils that goes through yours. And that's an awareness that God is in charge. God still loves you and cares about you because you're still breathing. <laughs> When you stop breathing, is when you got to worry. Then it's too late. Yep. The origin of sin and death was due to Adam's violation of the commandment of Genesis 2.17, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, die, and you will die. Just like there's a plurality of death, there's a of life, there's a 
plurality of death. It, here it is. Adam. He makes this, it does this sin deal, right? We have no idea how long he lived because time is irrelevant when you're in eternity. Right? It's only, only relevant, watches are only relevant down here. So we don't know, but we do know how long he lived after he sinned. As soon as sin and death enter his life, we know how long he lived. Genesis 5.5 5 says he lived 930 years. You know what that means? That there was a point, listen, he was born, listen to me, he was born when he sinned. Now, he was created prior to that. He was born because, listen, if you've got a death date, you've got a birth date. Listen, you walk through the cemeteries if you wonder about that. Walk through the cemeteries and you'll see one thing that all, all, all headstones have other than a name. They have the birth date with a dash and a death date, right? Well, just go to the cemetery sometime. Well, you ain't got anything else to do. Just walk through there a little bit and walk. That's your, that dash is your whole life. Here's the date you were born. Here's the day. So Ecclesiastes, third chapter one says, here, there is a time to be born and a time to die. We know that this was his birth because we have a date on his death. That's how you count. <laughs> That's a, you don't even count in the womb, do you? No, you don't count till birth. Gives us all a heads up, a head start. Don't we they talk about a head start? We're all ready. We're actually nine months older than we are, aren't we? Forget that idea. Forget that idea. And so it's just interesting when you read this. That Adam's trans, trans, when Adam transgressed the commandment and he ate from the tree, sin and death was passed into the human race. You go like, whoa, that's not fair. I know. I didn't write the book. I'd have probably wrote it different. But there's a, like Romans, the, Romans the fifth chapter is really good, 12 through 21. That's really good. It says, wherefore by one man, Adam, wherefore is by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed on, sin death. Sin death was passed on to all mankind. And then he goes, he goes through verse, that, listen, and this is a wonderful read, and I put it on your paper to do an exercise in it. This is a wonderful read, Romans 5, 12 through 21, is a wonderful read. And I'm going to try to make it a, a, a little healthy and exciting for you. Okay? Uh, let's see, you'd have to look down on your paper to uh, point four. Look down to point four because I'm running out of time anyhow. Look down to ver point four. See where it says, note the contrast between Adam and Jesus Christ? Yeah. See, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ, right? Right. right. Now watch this. And here's, what, here, here's your home exercise. Here's your home study. I want you to take, I want you to go into Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. On this side, I want you to write Adam. And on this side, I want you to write Christ. And when you go through and read 12 through 21, 12 through 21, I want you to list the things that you have under Adam and list the things that you have under Christ. I want you to do that. You're going to be amazed what you find. And that's the way Paul is explaining this. You're either in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Here's what it means to be in Adam. Here's what it needs to be in Christ. The only way you can get from Adam to Christ is that he dies on the cross for your sins. He's buried and he's raised from the dead the third day. Colossians 1, 13 says that the moment you believe the gospel, this is called the gospel, Dies for your sins, buried, raised from the dead, third day to give you everlasting life. The gospel says that the moment you believe this, you, one part here, you are rescued, you are rescued by the, by, by the power of God. You are rescued from here and you're transferred over to here. 
rescued and transferred. And that's the process of, of Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, the gospel, by faith, right? And then it becomes the gift, not by works, but by grace. For you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. This whole deal here is a gift. And you're going to see this in Romans. He's going to talk about the gift, and he's going to tell you exactly what you have in Christ in this passage. He's going to list some things over here. And, and if you're over here, and listen, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of these are gone forever. Kaput. They're gone forever. Boom, gone. And now you are here in all of this. This is the package of salvation. Every bit of that is yours, and it's yours forever. It's a gift. That thing in Romans is dynamite. I want you to do that. When you, this weekend, because it's going to be a boring weekend after, after the holidays anyhow. So, so just, nothing's really happening. Nothing's really happening. That's more important than the word of God. <laughs> I got you back with that one, didn't I? Well, anyhow, it, it's important to read that. I, I really think you'll enjoy that. Now, let me, I want you to put your eyes on, go to 2 Corinthians. We're in 2 Corinthians 5, right? Mm -hmm. right. So let's drop, drop back one chapter. And um, this is uh, the secret of beauty right here. Right here. You know how you worry about those wrinkles and you spend all that high money to, you know. Here's a set. Look at verse 16. Let's say I got, I put this down on paper, 16 through, what did I put it on? 16 through what? 18. All right. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Hey, Tony, what, what's the deal? What's the deal with your heart deal? What, Tuesday. I go, in, I go in Sunday morning and surgery Monday. Okay. Uh, All right, we're back on track with that then. Okay. Because I was just thinking somehow Tuesday, and I looked down there and I see, wait, it's Tuesday and you're still here. But it was next week. <laughs> okay. I, I thought that, well, that was good surgery. God bless you for coming to class. I'll be here next Tuesday, too. I hear you, baby. I love that. I believe that. In spirit, uh, I have a great father. Well, I believe that. We all do. Yay. I love that. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though the outer man is decaying. You know what we call that? Aging. That's what we call that. Yet our inner man, that's what got saved, is being renewed day by day. So what should you be spending more time working on? Outer beauty or inner beauty? Listen, there's only so much you can do to outer beauty just based on age. Right? It's boring. It's boring. <laughs> I hear you. Well, anyhow, listen, it does, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of the outer. The rest of us have to look at it, but <laughs> I mean, it, it, it should be all right there, <laughs> but the, but not by neglecting the inner beauty, right? Yeah, right? Inner beauty for listen. And here's how he describes aging. I love this. Listen to how he described. And, and, and I remember one lady, I preached this one time in another church and a lady after the church came up and said, I'm so disgusted with you men. You always talk this way. Listen to what it, it was over this one idea for momentary light afflictions, afflictions for momentary. He's talking about the aging process. And uh, she took offense to the idea that it was, that it was a momentary light of affliction. Uh, I just had to, it, listen, honey, it's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse. I mean, 
And I, I recommended, that's back when Chuck Farmer had a, a ministry. I recommended her go with Chuck. I said, I've got a guy in the church who's just a wonderful guy. You need to have a, go with him on a couple missionary trip, go, go on ministry trips with him. I didn't tell him it was that old age home, but <laughs> there's reality. Buddy, there's reality, yes. right? There's reality. Momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparisons. Because you know why? Because we're working on the inner beauty because you can't do anything to the outer beauty. I mean, you do what you can with it. I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't use some cosmetics and all that. I'm just saying not to neglect the inner because the inner is what's most important. Why? Because it's being renewed day by day while the outer part is wasting away. The inner part is being renewed day by day. So why would you, right? And listen, it is the inner beauty that is reflected from you anyhow. Boy, Aunt Bice had it. Boy, I mean, she had it. I mean, she glowed. I mean, you had no idea what age she was. But it didn't matter. I mean, she just shined. She was like, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. I mean, she was better than anything I ever saw. Well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things were not seen eternal. So, you know, when you look in the mirror, try to see the inner person. Don't get depressed. Okay? And so you can read the rest of this uh, that's been out there. But l listen, over the, over, the, over the holidays, steal a little moment and do that exercise in Romans. You are going to love this. See that. When you lay that thing out, you're going to love it. When you lay that thing out, put a, everything in the column of Adam and put the other, and it's be clear for you, and put the other column of Christ. You're going to look at that, and you go like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because all that stuff in Adam is gone, and all this stuff in Christ has been given to me as a gift. Not based on my character, whether I was a good boy or a bad boy. It doesn't matter. I believed. And I got this. Well, let me close this session down, and then we'll have a prayer time of fellowship with our, our prayer time. Let me close. Let the Internet off. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the study here of absence and presence at, with the body. Absent from the body, talking about death. Present with the Lord. At home, I love Paul, at home with the Lord, talking about death, whether we're absent from the body or present with the Lord. We're at home with the Lord. I pray that be true in our life as we prepare. We're all headed to the same, the same experience in life that will be death. And we can be encouraged and it can be a great moment in our life. And so, Father, I pray that the exercise we did today out of the Word of God, we called it Bible study, would be important to those who are visiting with us by the Internet, and they would pick up the study notes that they can get off the Internet and all the other things, and attend this series with us on Tuesday nights. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.